Um, okay. We we left at the women chapter. Uh, I mean, when we when we stopped to do our proper interview. Um, what you do look after in, in women, what, what are the characteristics that uh, attracts you? Because in, in book two you have uh, um, fantasy at least about a waitress, a music teacher and uh, and the cashier, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Uh, it's basically how all the people I meet. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and how does your wife, I mean, react to, to this uh, kind of uh, public confession? Uh, I think these parts were maybe most difficult for her, and that's, I mean, everybody knows that, at least I don't know how it is with women, but all men do these kind of things, you know, they see someone and they maybe turn around on the street, and which is silly because it's, you know, nothing will happen, but you just want to, see, you know, and it's accepted if you don't say it, I mean, everyone knows, but if you don't bring it up, it's okay, but I brought it up and said, okay, this is how I think I'm going to do, and, and it's hurtful, I think. And it's not meant to be said. Uh, you could say it in a novel, you know? I have a man who does that, and it's okay because it's not you, but I hear it actually is me, so... But uh, that's part of being honest, that's how it is. It's almost every woman I meet, I wonder how would it be to sleep with her, I mean, that's the first thought. And in Sweden, that's you know regarded as sexistic, sexistic, what was the word, sexist, sexist. Yeah, yeah. And maybe it is, but it doesn't mean that I don't respect you know anything. It's just like that's the first thing, and then something else happens. But but uh, yeah. No, what kind of woman? Uh, women? Yeah. Oh, I, I I don't know. Some must be some notion of something hidden, secret, I think. And beauty, of course, but that's some very interesting kind of beauty, some not, some not so interesting, so yeah. I don't know. But falling in love is different, then I think it's something else, something subconscious, something you need, or something you are. Uh, that, that kind of uh, governs it all. Uh, which is a, a mystery, because when you fall in love, it's like you just lose everything. <laughs> and why that is so, I mean, why that happened to that person, not to that person, it's a mystery. <laughs> but I don't think it has so much to do with, you know, how they look, but it's more like... Yeah. And um, still in, in book two, you you explain very honestly and very well uh, how you felt like less masculine in the moment in which you put yeah. your hands on the stroll of your daughter. Yeah. Uh, why why is it so? I mean, because there's the general image of um, a, a male who doesn't take care of his uh, children or. Uh, that, that's one of the subjects in the book, or in the books, uh, masculine identity. Yeah. And it's very complex and it's meant to be. Um, um, this was what I felt when I did it. It felt uh, like a kind of a reduction or... That I wasn't supposed to do this. I don't know why. I was, you know, raised in the 70s and it didn't look like that then. My father and his generation weren't parents in that way. Uh, but still, this changed, and now every everybody I know are doing this. I mean, at the same time, and it's not like it's planned. It just happens, you know. <laughs> and. So I have an idea what it is to be a man, and an idea what it is to be a father, that kind of crashed with reality. But it's not like that now. I mean, I have no problem with dealing with these things at all. So it's 
It has a lot to do with immaturity and insecurity, I believe. And then I was a very feminine boy. Uh, in, in book three is very much about that I cried a lot and was a coward and I liked clothes and <laughs> and you shouldn't, uh, if you would be a real boy, you shouldn't do any of these. So I was, uh, in when I was 13, I was called feminine by everybody. <laughs> and that was very tough because when you're 13 you are in the puberty and and the identity is you know very very flow floating and so I after that I, I tried to be you know like an, a project to be more masculine and to be more like I should be and the point is you could see all those stages in the book and it's not that I appreciate myself as you know not liking taking care of small children, but it that was just how it felt. And I'm also interested in the difference between what you shall feel and what you're supposed to feel and what you're supposed to do, <laughs> and how you really feel and and you know what you really want to do. Because it's also a kind of a taboo to say those kind of things. You are supposed to take care of that project or take part of that project happily. And some men are, and a lot of men are not. But you're not allowed to express it in Scandinavia. And then you are, you know, barbaric or right-wing or whatever. <laughs> Conservative or... But I have four kids and I, you know, I'm really close to them all and I do take care of them, so... <laughs> So we may say that also you you made peace also with the representation of you at the exterior. I mean, you are aware and and you had you have no problems anymore with the fact of. Uh, it's like more like I can't afford to have yeah. problems with it because <laughs> it's you know it's such a big part of my life. Yeah. So it's not it's not an option. Yeah, <laughs> it's not it has to work into function. And I am a little, little, little bit more confident now than I was. And I'm not as afraid and not, not as occupied with what other people think anymore. And I, but I was that very much in <laughs> when I started to write my struggle. Okay. Um, talking briefly about parents, th th there's a poem of uh, Philip Larkin that... Uh, according to me, fit to this. I mean, they fuck you up, your mom and dad. They may not mean to, but they do. They fill you with the faults they had and add some extra just for you. Uh, w what was the, the worst mistake uh, of, uh, of your father in raising you? Uh, and mistake? I mean, all, it's, yes. it's, yeah, it was all, I think, based upon his character. So I don't think it was a mistake, but he <laughs> was... It was the unpredictability, his unpredictability, that I never could know how we will react on something. So it was very unstable and I never knew what was going to happen. It was very un unsecure in a way. That was the big, big problem. I mean, I think you can hit a kid and there would be no problem if, if there is a kind of a, you know, certain rules and you know what's going to happen and, and, and okay there's a punishment if I do this but for me it was like a punishment if I did something one day and not a punishment the other day and it was large and big punishments for very small things one episode I mean where, where he was you know furious and in a rage where I have lost a suck you know which is in the third book I think and those kind of episodes are that's not good but still, it's basically for me, and, and I think maybe the notion of a happy childhood is, is very unproductive, at least. I mean, if you have a if you have a kind of an harmonic childhood, you tend to tend to cre that creates something, you know. I think, and, and maybe the drive you have to do things come from that, you know, all kind of things. So I'm, 
I think my child was exactly how it was meant to be. But as a par parent, I do not want my children to have that drive, or I, I want them to be happy, you know. That's the goal and the aim. And that's, you know, that's very difficult. So if, so if, if they start to write novels, I have failed completely, you know, <laughs> as a father, I think. So the thing that you don't want to repeat with them is to be unstable. Yeah, I mean, that's if, right. if yeah. for them not to know how you will react. Yeah, that's the worst so thing. So you, yeah. you, you want them to know if they do something, they will be, uh, they will have consequences. But I mean, you have they. they that's will what have I to know. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. When they were smaller, and I was very frustrated, and it was kind of very intense. I could lose temper and and behave and predict, like in you know. Like my father did, but less and less so, and now it's almost not existent. So I think it's I think it's better in that area. Yeah. While your mother was associated with uh, calm, tranquility, I mean. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's right. And I think that's enough. One, one parent that are stable and you can trust. Can she could make up also for the other in a way? Yeah. In a way, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, last question about the kids, and then we are pretty almost done. Uh, didn't you pose yourself the question of uh, the, the thing that you were going? To write about you, about your wife, could in the future uh, affect them or affect yeah. their, their stability yeah. in a way. I mean, I, I guess that they haven't read yet. Not, 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 no. Not, no. No. Yeah. But, but you, you wrote some, somewhere or you replied to some interviews that they searched on the internet for themselves and they, they, they found out that they were on the internet. Yeah. Uh, how, how do you handle that or how do you think you will handle that in the future? Uh. Uh, that's, I mean, that's, uh, I have done it, and it's, you know, it's there, and sometimes I feel guilty for it, sometimes I do not, because it's, it is a part of their life, and it's a special thing, it's, you know, not a common thing, yeah. but if it's going to, you know, be bad for them, I don't know, I think having, it is, could be difficult anyway to have a father that is a public figure, yeah. that is, different from the other kids, you know. Um, and of course, it's not what I write about them, because they're so small, and but it's, it's the fact that everybody knows about us. That's uh, that's not nothing I like. But it's, you know, it's a part of their life, so... Hopefully it will be all, all right. Yeah, and we may also say that by... by writing that book and by becoming the, the person you became you can offer them ma many many other things and many other stimulus that maybe before they couldn't have so yeah maybe in a way, yeah. yeah 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 there are you know it's, yeah, there is a trade-off yeah, yeah. <laughs> and i can't predict what's going to happen you know okay um on a totally different subject, uh, you didn't know how to use Skype, it seems, before the Paris Review. No. No? Uh, w what is your relationship with internet and technology in general? I'm, I'm just, you know, discovered Spotify just two <laughs> weeks ago. <laughs> and I, I kind of, you know, almost like I recommended it to my friends. You know what, Spotify, that's, you know. <laughs> so I'm, I'm not good at, at um, technology at all. Um, so I use internet for emails and reading newspapers, and that's it. <laughs> and Skype is... I don't like Skype at all. I think it's... No. Why? Because you don't like uh, video conferences? Yeah. <laughs> I don't like phones either, to talk on the phone. I don't like meeting people either, so it's, it's, <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, it's all kind of things. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. 
Okay. Um, the only public figure, if I'm not mistaken, because I'm, um, but still the, the the big public figure that enters into your book, which should be number six, are Hitler and Breivik. Yeah. W why did they get into your book? I mean, why it, it, it didn't let much of the outside world uh, as public figures enter your book, and you made an exception for for them? Why? Yeah. Why so? Uh, that's that wasn't planned. It was partly because of the title yeah. I choose. That led me to read. I thought I must must read Mein Kampf by Hitler. Mm. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of Hitler books there. Yeah, yeah and, and I did. And I thought I should write a little bit about it, about the book, because the book is a representation of self. You know, he writes a little bit about his father and his mother. Um, and then there was this thing with names in... The book six should be about the consequences of the other other books. And I thought a lot about names. Because uh, my father's family said you can't use your father's name. And I don't. I call him dad or father or... And I just started to speculate about... About... Um, about names. And I read a, an essay about... Of Ingeborg Bachmann. Austrian writer. Mm -hmm. uh, she writes about names in fiction, the difference between names in Faulkner and Joyce. And, and I was interested in that and I started to write about that. And in that book there is a, a poem by Paul Salam. They were friends and even lovers, I think. And I started to read that poem and I realized there's no name in this poem. There's no even no, no name on places, no persons, and it's it's almost like there are no meaning left, only a little, you know, a few words there. And I realized this is the consequences of Mein Kampf. You know, there's Mein Kampf, and then there is uh, Nazism and Second World War, and then there is Porcelain, which is kind of a ruins of, of the language, and, and that's what's left of, of it. That's what's possible. This is possible. Nothing else is possible after after Holocaust. And then I started to write about uh, about that, and it just grew and grew and grew. So uh, the, the piece on Hitler is 400 pages, I think. And then when I was doing that, the end of that project, uh, the thing at Ute happened, and I felt like, you know, this is some of this I recognize. Some of this is the same, uh, like the person, Breivik, and the person Hitler. The, the characteristic of, of them. There were some similarities that interested me, and then there was something in the time that interests me, you know, anti Semit uh, in Vienna 1910 was kind of similar to what was going on in anti immigration, anti Muslim in, in Norway, I realized. And then Breivik wrote a manifesto which I read. I didn't read it all, but I read a lot of it, and it reminded me, some of it reminded me of, of Mein Kampf, so I wrote about it. And it is also because there is a personal story here. When my grandmother died, we found Mein Kampf in her, you know, living room. <laughs> it wasn't thrown away, it wasn't, uh, it was hidden, but it, you know, they could, and I think that's common for very many Norwegian that did read the book or had the book or and um, I think that's the story of our time you know the the, the, the race the, the German culture I mean so so brilliant and so many companists composers uh, authors and then it kind of completely collapsed into barbarism and then we define ourselves against all that. So it's become a, yeah, and, and, uh, this is, so this is the, everything in Nazism is the opposite of what we try to achieve, you know. And so I thought this is, uh, in a way, all these kind of things made it natural for me to write about Hitler.
and I enjoyed it. It's the only part I enjoyed in my struggle to write, because it wasn't about me, and because I was very curious. How <laughs> is this possible? You know, how come? How could this man have this following? How could Germany do this? I mean, that's. Hitler was 16, he was in love, and he didn't dare to approach that girl. And he sent postcards to her without telling who he was, uh, asking her to wait for him and he would come back as a success or something like that. And I could, you know, identify with that very much and remember how it was to be 16. <laughs> and yeah, this kind of just felt very relevant in a way. Okay, um, one very quick thing about the title. Yeah. Uh, because you you don't look like, of course, I don't know you. So I mean, it's just an impression by reading that your first and, and part of the second book, which I will finish very soon. But um, you don't look like someone who's marketing oriented, not, not a marketing oriented guy. No. But the title. Yeah. Seem. I mean, the, ch the choice of the title could be read also as a, a great marketing ploy. I mean, because it was yeah. a, a, a name meant for scandal. Yeah. Okay. I mean, yeah. it was you. It was the publishing house. It was half you, or I mean, no, came the by no. The publishing no. house said no initially. They said no. No, no, you <laughs> can't do that. Okay. So no, it, it wasn't them. They accepted it, you know, in the end. But I didn't put that title. <laughs> no, it wasn't because of money it was or it was because of I think it was a way of me to say fuck you <laughs> I don't care about you know what people think and, and I think it's a fabulous title I think it's a very good title because it is you know it is the opposite of Hitler's my struggle it is really is yeah and that's you know it's kind of an ironic title, but it is still relevant. It is a struggle, and it's my struggle, and that's what the book is about. So, but of course, it, it, it was a provocation also. But I didn't expect the attention. <laughs> but the working title was Argentina, and we discussed that in that interview. The working title was? Yeah, Argentina. Ah. And we discussed that in the interview now, earlier today, what will happen if, if the book actually was called that. And <laughs> I, uh, no, nothing would have happened. <laughs> Nobody would have been interested. <laughs> but that was the title. And why so? Uh, it, it's like this book is so much about longing, Yeah. wanting to be in another place, you know, in literature, in, in art, or every every place but there. And there's one country since I was a kid that I've been that kind of dream country. I've never been there. <laughs> there was ten and saw the World Cup in Argentina, saw those images. And then when I get older, I read Buches, you know, and it's the same thing, it's kind of a dream continent. It's It's all fiction for me and it's fantastic <laughs> fiction. And then we got Gombrovich who wrote his diary there, and it's kind of a, so I thought, and I, I know I'm never going to be in Argentina, I'm never going to get there, it oh, will only be in my dreams, and I thought that's a good title, but it isn't, so it wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> cool, I didn't know that. No. Interesting. We are at last topic, uh, about writing. Yeah. Okay. Um, you, you give a wonderful definition of writing itself in the same Paris Review interview, which is a cold hand on a warm forehead. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's great. But can you speculate a little more about, about this? I mean, it's, it sounds perfect, but if, if you want to say a couple of more words about I it. I will just ruin it, because it's, it's, uh, it's, <laughs> it is that yeah. sentence, you know. Yeah. Yeah. No, but I think it's... Uh, 
So if we, if you don't want to ruin that, I mean, just speculate a little more about the function of writing. Yeah. According to you, of course. Yeah. Um, it is. It is the feeling of, I mean, a lot of people ask if this is a therapy for me, but it is not, not whatsoever. But it still is kind of a healing thing to do. It is, you know, you are creating something uh, which is not yourself. It's something outside of yourself, which is great. Uh, and it leads you to places where you haven't been or even thought you should go to and you don't know why but it's, it's a kind of dynamic between you and and literature basically I mean it's I'm writing it but it doesn't feel like it because it feels like I'm throwing myself out to something objective to language or to 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 literature and something else is coming back which directs me another place and another place and another place so it's a way of you know getting free free from yourself in a way uh, it's the only place I know of where I am free of myself and it is uh, always moving you know always movement it's never and nothing is standing still um, it's uh, I think Deleuze and the uh, French Philosopher is yeah. talking about the being of it. It's always in the being, you know. It's not. It's it's really is a present thing. And and I know if I start a book, you know, on a Saturday, it will end up differently if I start it on a Monday, you know. It, it is like that, because you have all those elements that meets, and it's not static. It is very influenced by the surroundings and what happen happen and and. And it also is connected with uh, society in general or, or the culture in general, and you don't know that, but but it is. Uh, I think maybe ninety nine percent of my struggle is, you know, common things that we have in common, that is, you know, related to the culture and to films, other writings, events, everything, you know. And that's fascinating because you are all by yourself. And you sit by yourself and you're isolated, but still it's the most, it's then I'm the most connected to the world is when I'm writing. So it is kind of an opening up of the self that is radical, I think. Um, yeah. But it is, you know, hell as well to, to write. And it's, this is, you know, the, the best it's the optimal part of it, but it takes very long time to get there. So when I start a new novel, it takes a year of of failure and very unsatisfying process. <laughs> but then you get somewhere, and then things start to happen, and you don't control it yourself. Of, of course you do, but it still is kind of unconscious processes. So when I wrote my struggle, I, I got a lot of things, you know, for free. If I had a problem in the writing, in the one o'clock in, you know, in the day, I could just stop and then I could sleep and then I woke up very early and it, the problem was solved. And that what happened every day. It was not a problem. And that's the process, you know. That's what's working in you, and that's what you want. But if you're outside of it, it's it's terrible because then you attack the problems with your mind and reflections, and then you, you know, then there's no solution to anything. It's just bad. And all writers I know have this experience, and I think it's the same with you know, painters and actors and film directors and everybody who does something like this. Or musicians or composers or yeah. <laughs> um, okay. I, in a way, your project uh, to map your life in a one-on-one -on -one scale, in a way. Yeah. 
It reminds me of, uh, of the library of, uh, of Borghesian memory, I mean, in which he wanted to, to do a library in which he had all the books of the world, exactly yeah. all the books of the world. Um, great literature uh, wants necessarily to include everything in, inside a book, or there is this scope, yeah. this ambition of putting yeah. everything inside, uh, which everything can, can be interesting, even if the fact that you you throw away the, the, the sticks of the candies of your kids and yeah. there, there is this ambition of totality in what, what you do. Um, yeah, yeah it is. And it is a kind of a reaction to the minimalism that was, you know, predominant when I started to write, I think. Where it's the opposite. That's that's the kind of essence of things, you know, and, and, and that's basically, I think, the best novels are like that, the essence, the, you know, the, the perfect novel. Um, for instance, Malt Lerid Brigge by Rainer Maria Rilke, his novel, or Death in Venice by Thomas Mann, or those kind of novels. But then this is, this is more like uh, Moby Dick, where everything is just thrown in. And I, 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 I like that. I mean, I like that approach and I like that ambition.